spot. I don't know. <laughs> I still don't know what crazy means. Okay. 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 So uh, yeah. So thanks for ha um, having me at the the Dublin brunch. I'm guessing these are fairly informal talks. So. No, very formal. <laughs> 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 I gotta go, guys. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, so just so I work on uh, uh, theoretical neuroscience, and so I just want to share some general thoughts about this field, why I think it's so exciting. Um, one of the reasons it's so, um, anyway, one of the reasons it's so exciting is that, you know, we have lots and lots of new technologies for probing the brain across multiple scales of organization. You know, all the way up from macroscopic behavior all the way down to single molecules and everything in between. Right, so this allows us to see the immense complexity of the brain uh, in, in many ways for the first time and at so many different scales simultaneously. And so to understand or to obtain a conceptual understanding of this data, it's actually useful to turn to tools and techniques from the physical and mathematical sciences that have themselves developed their methods to deal with complexity in other domains. But of course, neural systems aren't just simply tangled webs of complexity that exist for their own sake. They've evolved over billions of years of evolution to solve important computational problems. So uh, this field also connects to the computational sciences uh, in, in, in two ways. Uh, one is a source for inspirations as to what computational brain is actually doing. And, and second, of course, to use the tools developed in these fields to analyze uh, uh, data. So it's an incredibly exciting, very interdisciplinary field um, that involves lots of you know, wide swath of the canvas room. Um, so part of what we do is we're, we work closely with experimental labs, uh, where we work on specific problems with those labs in a close iterative loop between theory and experiments. So for example, we've been working on trying to understand how the retina processes the first steps of vision. Interesting, the retina itself is a kind of a deep neural network with one hidden layer. So it's very easy to control light in the photoreceptors and record from the ganglion cells, but it's very hard to record from the interior. So recently we fit deep neural network models uh, of the retinal response to natural seeds in collaboration with Steve Backus. And uh, these networks became the state-of-the-art models of how the retina processes natural stimuli, the very stimuli they were evolved to process. Interestingly, these models generalize to recapitulate decades of artificial stimuli, uh, the retinal response to artificial stimuli. These are kind of complicated experiments that people have performed. But then these deep networks of themselves are hard to understand, so we applied model reduction techniques to understand exactly how our deep network model predicted the response to multiple artificial stimuli, and we extracted simple models that were consistent with models written down in the literature for which we had such models, and, and other models were actually new models that lead to experimentally testable hypotheses. Uh, with the Clendenin lab, we've done similar stuff in, ter try in terms of trying to understand the algorithms underlying how the fly estimates motion. Uh, flies and humans are separated by 800 million years of evolution, but it turns out the circuits for detecting motion are actually conserved, and that's an uh, example of convergent evolution because the eyes in the fly and the human evolved after the split between fly and human. Um, I'll, tell you, I'll say more about this in, in this talk about understanding these grid cells, these emergent representations of space in the rodent. Uh, we've, we've actually worked with Krishna's lab on trying to understand theories of neural dimensionality, dynamics, measurement, control, uh, and so forth, which has been lots of fun. Um, you know, we've also been working with the Raymond Lab on, on trying to understand why mutant mice get smarter. So mice with certain modifications to their synaptic plasticity, genetically induced modifications, <coughs> you know, uh, can be smarter or, 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 or less smart, depending on their prior experience. Uh, so that's kind of a, a, a quick summary of some of the projects we've worked on. But you know, in a, in a much more general sense, um, there's a really nice motivation for an alliance between theoretical neuroscience and and theoretical machine learning through the following kind of um, logic which we laid out in this uh, uh, opinion piece. So, you know, we're kind of in this game because we'd like to understand how the brain or neural circuit works. Uh, but what does that even mean? Uh, a more proximal version of that question could be we'd like to understand how the connectivity and dynamics of the neural circuit gives rise to behavior. Um, and also, uh, learning is important. We'd like to also understand how neural activity and synaptic learning rules conspire to self-organize useful connectivity that subserves behavior. I'll give you an example of that uh, in a bit. But what's interesting is the field of machine learning has generated lots of interesting learned neural networks that accomplish interesting functions, functions we know of no other way of accomplishing in any artificial system at the moment. What's scary, I think, for neuroscientists is that we know everything about these artificial systems. We know their connectivity, we know their dynamics, we know their learning rules, 
We know their entire developmental experience from when they're baby random networks to when they grow up to become trained neural networks uh, in a few days. And um, yet we don't have a meaningful understanding of how they learn and work, nor do we even have a benchmark for what such understanding would even look like once we found it. Okay. So um, this provides sort of an interesting laboratory to sharpen our theoretical tools to try to understand what it means to understand how distributed nonlinear circuits compute in situations where we do have all the data, and then take that understanding back to neuroscience to help design experiments in neuroscience. I don't think for a second that if we understand these artificial circuits, we'll directly understand biological circuits. But the methods that we use to arrive at that understanding, the techniques that we use, might help us streamline the design of experiments in neuroscience. Um, uh, so anyways, we, we, we have a, some, some work on that. Oh, right, yeah, I have. So we've actually been working on the theory of, of, of deep learning, a whole bunch of different questions. Here's some papers from the last few years. What's kind of fun, uh, you know, I was trained as a string theorist. I wasn't trained as a neuroscientist. So, but it's actually kind of fun that we can bring in some interesting mathematical tools from statistical physics and Ramanian geometry and random matrix theory to understand um, uh, uh, some things in, in, in how deep neural networks learn and compute. Uh, we just recently wrote, if you're interested, we recently wrote a uh, annual reviews of condensed matter physics uh, article on the statistical me mechanics of theory. <coughs> so even condensed matter theorists are interested in, in computer science now, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so we reviewed a whole bunch of things, you know, what, what can deep networks express or say that shallow networks can? Uh, what is the shape of the error landscape of neural networks? How do signals propagate through neural networks? How do deep neural networks generalize? Some of Andrea's articles are actually, you know, we reviewed some of those in here. They were great articles, by the way. And, uh, you know, how can we generate um, uh, generative models in, in deep learning and how do we understand those? So, so if you're, this isn't actually, I apologize, it's not yet up in the archive, but if you're interested, send me an email, I can send you the, uh, uh, the article. Um, it should appear in the journal uh, soon. So maybe I'm getting rid of this one, but what's yeah. the relation, I mean, how's this related to statistical mechanics? Yeah, so statistical mechanics, so that's a very long story, but there's been a very rich history of interactions between statistical physics and deep learning. To make a long story short, basically statistical <coughs> physics has to do with understanding ground states of complex uh, probability, or mm -hmm. sorry, low energy states of complex probability distributions defined by an energy where probability is e to the minus energy, like a Boltzmann distribution. So it's all about energy minimization with fluctuations. Machine learning is all about maximizing the log likelihood of data over the parameters of a statistical model in many situations. Mm -hmm. So if you create energy with minus log likelihood, there's a lot of isomorphisms between the problems that physicists solve and the problems that uh, uh, machine learning people solve. Mm -hmm. uh, but it goes much deeper than that. There's a lot of techniques in applied mathematics mm -hmm. for analyzing nonlinear dynamics, gradient descent, and so on that can be applied in machine learning. And, and so there's kind of a discrepancy between the tools that machine learning people often work with and physicists work with, but, but there's a subset of people who kind of know about that. I think Andrea is a world expert in that. In fact, Andrea and I were just in, in Rome at a, uh, at a conference, on, uh, a specific physics conference, a replica signature breaking, that, that had a lot of physicists and machine learning people working together. Uh, and New Rips this year, there's a workshop in machine learning and physics, so, which, you know, which, you know, which so, so there's a long history of that. It's actually quite exciting, uh, I think. So, so you mean mathematically singular? Mathematical uh, equivalence. Is just yeah. optimizing yeah. the ground state, uh, exactly. you know, axiom model, et cetera. Yeah, but it goes much deeper than just that. Um, uh, but yeah, that's the basic idea. Uh, but I won't, I, I, these are kind of very technical things, so I won't bother you at doubly lunch with the technical stuff. I, I actually just wanted to talk about just one story that's kind of an overview of the, the, the types of things we work on, experimental neuroscience, theoretical neural networks, and, and the interplay between the two. I kind of want to tell you just a fun story that involves mice and navigation and uh, virtual reality and, and you know lunchtime stuff. Uh, so this is actually a series of uh, uh, papers that I've worked on with a close collaborator of mine, uh, Lisa Giacomo, in the neurobiology department. Uh, none of this work would have been possible without her. And it's a talented group of um, grad students. Oh, I guess you can't see. Yeah, it's a talented group of grad students um, and, and, and a postdoc who worked on this, and this is a series of papers. Um, but I can kind of summarize it for you at a high level. So here's the basic idea. Here's a problem that's common to both uh, machine learning and neuroscience. Uh, for this crowd, it's a simultaneous localization and mapping problem. 
uh, which, which I'm sure you all know about. But the basic idea is how does an animal or robot, when it enters a new environment, uh, know where it is? How does it localize where it is? When it doesn't even yet have a map of the environment because it's the first time it's entered the environment. Okay, so to localize where it is, it has to build a map of the environment. But how does it build a map of the environment if it doesn't even know where it is, right? So this is the simultaneous localization mapping problem. It's a chicken and egg problem. And there's many algorithms for solving this uh, in an iterative way through exploring an environment. But what we'd like to try to understand is how, I mean, I mean mice have to solve this problem as well, right? So the question is, how do the neural networks of the mouse, through very local mechanisms of synaptic plasticity, and neural dynamics conspire to learn a map of a new environment over time through exploration, right? Any individual neuron doesn't know about the sum totality of the environment. Any individual synapse doesn't know about the sum totality of the environment. So how do these local degrees of freedom conspire to solve a global problem? That, that's kind of what we're up against. Okay, so now what's surprising, here's some phenomenology about the mouse medial entorhinal cortex. You don't, you don't need to know exactly those words, but it's a region of the brain that has very interesting high-level neural correlates of space, right? So here's a border cell. So, so what you're looking at is a 2D enclosure that a mouse has explored. People in Lisa's lab have recorded from a single cell, in the, I mean, they've recorded from many cells, but here's one example of a cell. And this is a heat map of where the cell fired as the mouse explored the environment. And as you can see, this, this cell fires if and only if the mouse is at the border of an environment, so we call it a border cell. There's also speed cells that fired uh, in direct proportion to how fast the mouse is running. Uh, there's head direction cells that fire if and only if the angular orientation of the head is within a certain range. Okay? And this is kind of the, one of the most interesting things that recently got a Nobel Prize for its discovery. It's a grid cell that fires if and only if the mouse is at the vertices of a hexagonal grid. Right? Now who ordered that? Okay. <laughs> in, so the head direction is with respect to some absolute uh, yeah, it, it doesn't matter, right? You choose an externally external coordinate system. Whatever coordinate system you have, it'll be localized somewhere. Yeah. So um, you, you could ask, uh, you know, if I move the landmarks slightly, does, does this, this, you know, what anchors the, the orientation? And there's a complicated interplay between landmarks and internal context that anchors the particular angle at which it fires. Um, so this is actually pretty cool. It's some recent work that we've done that I actually won't tell you about, that we're kind of writing up. Uh, that's not the reason I'm not telling you about it, but I just don't have the slides for it. But we've been able to train uh, an artificial neural network to navigate, and we found simple, sufficient conditions for these grid cell representations to naturally emerge. And it connects to the theory of pattern formation in, in physics. So that's a nice example of machine learning, physics, and neuroscience all working together to explain how grid cells might naturally emerge just through the process of solving a computational problem, which is path integration. I'll tell you a different way of modeling this where we actually hand tune the network to solve this problem to some extent. So Surya, just to make yeah. sure, the x, y coordinates here yeah. correspond to physical space? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah it's, a, it's absolutely physical space. So this is a 2D enclosure. It's one meter by one meter. The mouse has been running around. They record from a single cell. And they count how many spikes did it fire in this region, this region, this region, and that's a histogram. Red means it fired a lot, blue means it fired not at all. Right, so basically the cell fires if and only if the mouse is at the vertices of a hexagonal grid. Okay. Um, all right, so, so, so okay, so this is very high level correlates of space deep within the mouse's brain, far from the sensory motor periphery. But it's important to realize that the sensory motor periphery doesn't have these representations to begin with, right? The mouse is receiving extremely low level inputs it's receiving a pitter-patter of photons on its photoreceptors. It's receiving low-level muscle spindle inputs from stretches of its muscles as it moves. It might be also receiving efferent motor commands that, that, that apply torques to the muscles or, or, or the bones, right? Then out of these low-level signals, it has to construct through various algorithms these high-level representations of position, right? We're gonna focus on the last stages of this computation because how we know where we are, at least algorithmically, can be described by fusing two information sources, right? One is I can integrate my velocity of motion, and I can compute where I am, but I can also correct my internal estimate of position by landmarks that have a fixed position in the environment, right? So we're gonna focus on how path integration and landmarks 
can interact to generate internal estimates of position. In other works, we've looked at velocity uh, and things like that. How do you compute velocity? But um, so here's the basic idea. Any neural circuit that computes an internal estimate of position must obey a fundamental consistency requirement, right? And that requirement is basically, um, let's imagine that you see some landmark, landmark A. And let's say sensory perception of landmark A triggers some neural activity pattern A in, in, in the spatial map forming circuit. Then let's assume that you move from landmark A to landmark B. So you integrate your velocity to update your position. And let's say that this path integration evolves this pattern to a new pattern B prime. Alternatively, you could have just started at landmark B and experienced landmark B, and sensory perception of the landmark would trigger a pattern B. Okay? Consistency demands that the pattern you get from going this way to the pattern you get from starting here should be the same. So B should equal B prime. So the question is, you know, let's say you're entering a new environment for the first time, and you don't know how long it is, you haven't seen these landmarks, how do you solve this global consistency requirement? So, um, by the way, even before we start all of this, th there's actually a fundamental theoretical question, which is what governs the stability of these hexagonal firing patterns? There's two possibilities, because th these are averaged over one hour of, of exploration. So, and if you do it in the first half hour, or the second half hour, you get the same pattern. So there's extremely long time scale stability of this internal pattern in the brain. What is its origin? There's two possibilities, extremely precise integration of velocity to compute position. The other extreme possibility is its path integration, is, velocity integration is very noisy and it's continuously corrected by landmarks. Okay, so circa 2015, that wasn't, we didn't know which one was the case, but we devised some analyses, and I won't go into the details, we just devised some analyses to show that it was the latter possibility. Path integration is extremely noisy, and the only reason you see an hour-long stability of this pattern is because the mouse is continuously encountering border, borders, and whenever it hits a border, that corrects the internal estimate of position. And uh, errors in path integration accumulate so rapidly that in 40 seconds, this pattern would decohere, were it not for continual encounters with the border that occur on a time scale much faster than 40 seconds. So velocity integration is noisy, but, but the internal estimate of the position is continuously corrected by landmarks. So the details are, are, are in that paper. So yeah, the, yeah, does this correspond to one cell? That so yeah, that's one it? cell, exactly. That, and there are many, many more cells like this. They actually form modules, where the modules are characterized by the same uh, periodicity, but different phases. So there'll be another cell that's the same periodicity, but shifted, another that's shifted again. And then there's other modules that are the same, but a different periodicity, a different wavelength, so to speak. <clears throat> and those modules are actually spatially organized in the brain from the dorsal to ventral axis, which is pretty cool. Um, and actually there's models that, oh, actually let me not get into that. Um, okay, so with this experimental evidence in hand that landmark cells do indeed correct the internal estimate of the position on a quite frequent basis, can we derive an analytically solvable attractor model with plastic synaptic inputs from landmark cells that can indeed learn a consistent environmental map through, uh, through um, uh, exploration? So we derive such a model, we solved it analytically, it makes predictions, it, it suggests a subtle history dependence in the, in the uh, grid cell firing rates. And it actually predicts, you know, if you put these mice in deformed containers, the grid cells will deform like jello. Okay, I'll show you that data soon, but we, we can explain that, that, that phenomenon. Then, you know, an interesting thing that you can do, this is just a testament to the experimental control that Lisa has in her lab. To really probe, a, you EE people know this, to really probe a system, break it, and then see if you can put it back together, right? So, uh, through virtual reality experiments, we basically change the relationship between how much you move and what you see. We basically alter the laws of physics themselves. And then we ask, how does the system respond? And that gives us really interesting tests of the model. Uh, and what we'll find is if, if there's a, well, let me, let me um, I'll go into more detail on that later if there's enough. Okay, so what is the model? So, so we're gonna put together a bunch of old technology in, in theoretical neuroscience and, and add some new twists to, to model the system and, and effectively get a very simple solution to the, to the 
slam problem with, 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 where the perception problem that we're assuming is solved for us. So basically, what we're going to imagine is we're going to imagine a neural network, and just for pedagogical purposes, I'm going to imagine the neurons are arranged on a ring. It doesn't have to be this way, but, but let's, let's just assume that. Let's assume that each neuron locally excites its neighbors, but delivers long-range inhibition to neighbors further away. And let's also assume that the connectivity is translationally, translationally invariant. So this connectivity is copied across the entire ring. Okay? And with appropriate nonlinearities and connection strengths, you can set it up such as this neural network, the steady state activity patterns constitute a set of bumps, right? So for example, this might be one activity bump where this neuron is the most active and the activity decays away because of the long range inhibition. But because of the translation invariance of the connectivity, if this is a stable activity pattern, so is every translate of this activity pattern. So this network has a one dimensional ring of bump activity patterns. It's called the ring attractor, and you know people have worked with this for, for, for a long time. So you can summarize the entire dynamical state of the system by a single number, at least the stationary states of the system by a single number. That's the phase of the bump. So we call this the attractor phase. So this is an attractor network because all activity patterns get attracted to become one of these bump patterns. Okay, so 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 even though it's a high dimensional dynamical system, its steady states are characterized by a single number that basically takes values on the circle. Okay, and we call that number the attractor phase because it, it um, determines the, the state of the attractor network. Okay, so now, what if you want to path integrate? Okay. Um, one way to do that is you're going to have to, uh, you want, you'd like to allow the bump to move at a rate proportional to your velocity. And so this was sorted out you know, in old works as well. One way to do this is to imagine that you have cells that are both position and velocity sensitive that fire in proportion to how fast the animal is going. I showed you an example of a real cell on the earlier slide, cells whose firing rate is proportional to velocity. Now let's assume that these velocity sensitive cells connect to the attractor network through a shifted activity pattern, okay? Um, so imagine what happens if the, cell, if the cell fires. So let's say the cell fires to eastward motion. If the cell fires, it provides a shifted connectivity to the circuit, so it'll cause the bump to move in this direction. Okay? If a west velocity selective cell fires, its shift we assume to be in the opposite direction, so it caused the bump to move in this direction. Now this seems like an ornate solution, but believe it or not, such a solution has been observed in the, in the brain of a fly. As a fly is moving its uh, head back and forth, there's literally a ring of neurons in the fly where the bump moves in proportion to how far the head has moved. So that's been observed at Janelia by the big Jayarama. Um, we don't think it's as simple in the, in the mouse, but, but <clears throat> again, this is just like, we don't have to have the circuit topologically look like that. It only has to topologically look like this. It doesn't have to actually look like that. Because in the fly, it actually looks like that. Okay, so now, this is a way to get grid cells, at least in one dimension, right? So now imagine that you're a physiologist, and you're peering in on the circuit. You stick an electrode into the circuit, and you record from this one neuron, okay? As the mouse moves from west to east, the bump goes round and round the circle. So if you're recording from one neuron, you're like observing a traveling wave at a, st at a fixed point. The activity of the wave or the bump goes up and down and you can get grid cells. Okay. Um, all right, so, so now, so this, this all existed before we started thinking about this, these ideas. Um, so, so yeah, so Barack and Feet were the first to model grid cells like this. But as you'll notice, um, there's nothing as yet that anchors the bump to a, a particular location in space. It just gets pushed around by velocity. So there's no connection to absolute space. And we believe we need that connection to absolute space to learn a specific new environment that's defined by a specific set of landmarks. Okay. So the new ingredient that we added are these landmark cells. So these are cells that under our definition fire if and only if the mouse is in a certain region of space. You could think of it, for example, as a border cell, which I showed you an example of on the first, on the first data slide. So, and, and then we imagine that these cells have incoming connectivity into this uh, circuit. 
Okay, now what, imagine what would happen if this, if this landmark cell fired, and these were the synaptic waves. It would provide excess excitation to the circuit, thereby breaking the translation invariance, and the bump would move and get pinned to the position of peak excitation. So we can characterize each landmark cell by something which we call its pinning phase, right? It's by definition the position of peak excitation to onto the ring provided by the attract by, by the landmark cell. And the effect of this pinning phase, if the landmark is encountered, is it moves the bump to this location. All right. <clears throat> okay, now we can start to see the origin of the potential inconsistency problem between path integration and landmarks. Let's say you've encountered a novel environment that you've never seen before. And let's say for whatever reason you encounter this landmark and maybe some, some initial circuitry makes a subset of cells fire. Those become the landmark cells for that landmark. And let's say the synaptic plasticity happened, sorry, let's say the synapses happen to provide excitation here, but path integration, which is an effect of the history of your motion, pushes the attractor phase to here. Now there's an inconsistency between where velocity tells the attractor network to be and where the landmark wants the attractor network to be. Okay? That's the inconsistency. But we can hope to solve this inconsistency by having plasticity which is basically a rule for changing the synapses based on activity. And a very common plasticity rule is, the notion, is Hebb's rule, the notion that cells that fire together wire together with some weight decay. So basically imagine that this attractor phase is here and these, the, these synapses are here, but there are other silent synapses to the rest of the circuit. So this cell and this cell are now coactive. They're both firing together, so heavy and learning will strengthen the synapse. These cells are not coactive, so there's some weight decay, so it'll weaken these uh, cells. And if you see this persistent relationship between velocity and landmarks enough, heavy and learning will slowly shift the synapses over to here and solve the consistency condition. That's the hope. Okay. Of course, it's much more complicated than that, than, that, than that, because now you have this coupled dynamical system between neural dynamics and synapses and multiple landmarks, and you, you need to show that this coupled dynamical system between neural activity and synapses can solve a global self-consistent condition when there's multiple landmarks and so forth. Okay. So to understand how that works, oh, by the way, yes. Um, so, so far I've been explaining everything we've, we've done in pictures, all right? So you might think I'm totally blowing smoke. I'm like a cartoon <laughs> theorist that just thinks in pictures. But actually there's mathematical equations underlying all of this. Good. Uh, but, but actually, we were so worried. <laughs> we were very worried. You were worried, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's more my insecurity than anything else. <laughs> but, uh, but we do have equations underlying all of this. There's 70 pages of. I, I get a little nervous when I. Sorry. <laughs> but, but, anyways, um, yeah, there are equations, but, but don't worry, I won't ever show them again because I can explain this in a way that's uh, honest to the equations, but just using cartoons. Okay, so, so let's, let's work through a first example to understand how the self consistent condition is solved. The simplest example is a mouse is just um, exploring a one-dimensional environment that has limited spatial extent. Okay. So it's like it's entered an environment, but it doesn't yet know how long it is. Okay. Imagine that there's some, some border cells for the west border, for the east border, um, you know, these border cells are often triggered by when the, the whiskers of the mouse touch the border, so you can imagine they're easily there. But, okay, so now let's imagine what happens uh, to the model in this environment. So it's entered the environment for the first time, right? So whatever the west border cell's pinning phase is, the attractor phase will get pinned to the west border cell's pinning phase. <coughs> then path integration will move the attractor phase over to here, but there's no guarantee that wherever the attractor phase ends up is equal to the pinning phase of the east border cell. But plasticity will then move the east border cell pinning phase a little bit closer to wherever the attractor phase ended up. And then the east border cell will pin the attractor phase. Then path integration will go backwards like this and end up again at an inconsistent location with the west border cell's pinning phase. But plasticity will move things over a little bit. 
Um, and then you can imagine after many rounds of, ex after a few rounds of exploration, depending on the speed of plasticity, what will happen is um, you'll get this happy, stable, steady state of the joint dynamics of neurons and synapses, where the pinning phase of the west border cell plus the phase advance due to path integration equals the pinning phase of the east border cell, and of course, vice versa. And in this happy state, the attractor phase of the network is independent of where you came from. Okay. So this is what we mean by saying the mouse has learned a spatial map of the environment and has effectively or implicitly learned along the environment. Yeah. Maybe you said this, but so here we're talking about changing the, where the landmark uh, actually yes. Guess, um, yeah, so that, this, but it, it, is it excites, right? Um, I guess. Some of us might want to make a phase lock loop or something like okay, that. Yeah. Actually, modulate the speed of of the um, of the bump rotation. So okay, I'll talk about that in the virtual reality uh, <laughs> uh, setup, okay. where we use curve motor oscillators to model what happens if you change the environment suddenly. Um, okay, so actually, in that context, so yeah. the um, the two dimensional image that you've shown um, does where they light up these cells. Yeah. Is it only about the spatial location or does it also have to do with the velocity? So yeah, so um, the answer as usual is complicated. There are um, a population of cells that are very position selective only and the grid cells are more like that. They're most sensitive to position and not to velocity. There's other cells that are more sensitive to velocity and not at all to position. And then there's some stuff in between. That stuff in between, we can also explain just by training neural networks to path integrate, and that things aren't as clean as the cartoon models that I'm, I'm showing you. Um, but you, you do have these extreme cell types in there. We, we had an entire paper on uh, using statistical models to characterize in an unbiased fashion the distribution of coding properties in, 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 in the brain, which I'm, I'm skipping now. Okay, so now, in order to make contact with experiments, we need to generalize all of this to two dimensions. And, and it, it's, not, it's not at all conceptually much more complicated. So, so let me actually skip it, but let me just say you can generalize all of this to two dimensions. The, the attractor ring becomes an attractor kind of sheet, and you get these hexagonal patterns in the sheet. And those arise from pattern formation dynamics that we understand well. Um, okay. But so, so now with this setup, we can actually write down a proof and, and uh, write down a theorem and prove it, right? So what we, the, the, the kind of English language kind of description of the theorem is, is the following. If you have for any number of localized landmarks in any dimension, it doesn't even have to be two, it could be three or, or 11 if you're a string theorist, but um, in any number of dimensions, Learning self-organizes all the landmark pinning phases so that the pinning phase of any landmark A plus the phase advance due to path integration ends up equaling the pinning phase of any other landmark B. Okay. I showed you how this worked out in pictures for a 1D environment, but this generalizes to multiple landmarks in arbitrary dimensions, and, and the proof is in this, in this page. Okay, so now let's make some predictions. Okay. It turns out in two dimensions, because you have both east and west border cells and north and south border cells, the way the borders interact with the environment is a bit more complicated, and I won't go into the details of that, but I'll just illustrate the prediction. It turns out that grid cells, our theory predicts that grid cells will get sucked into the border you just came from by a small amount for reasonable model parameters, for a one meter enclosure, this history dependence could be like two centimeters or something like that. So basically, if you leave the east border, the grid cells will get sucked into the east border a little bit, versus if you leave the west border, the grid cells will be sucked into the west border a little bit. When we made this prediction, I was like, oh crap, this is never gonna work out in the real data, but we had the data from Lisa's lab, so we could test this by cross-correlating the spatial representation condition of all trajectories leaving the west to the spatial representation obtained from, from all trajectories leaving the east, and lo and behold, it actually worked out. Without going into the details of what these plots mean, what we found is you do have to shift 
the west conditioned firing fields a little bit east to match the east conditioned firing fields, and you have to shift the south conditioned firing fields a little bit north to match the north conditioned firing fields. So there is indeed this small attraction of the grid cell representation in two dimensions to where you just came from. Now, that may not be a bug, it might be a feature, right? Because if your path integration is uh, noisy, your, the optimal estimator for where you are need not be an unbiased estimator, as we know. Right? You can do better in terms of overall error by having a biased estimator and trading off against the bias variance trade-off. So we're kind of looking at now Bayesian models to see if this biased internal estimate position is indeed optimal. You ever do weird experiments where you move the walls? Like yeah, yeah, years? there are those experiments, and, and um, well, I'll show you one of those. So this, this is actual data mm -hmm. from a, uh, a mouse traversing a weird shaped environment, right? A, you know, this shaped environment. And the grid cells bend a little bit. And before our work, there was no explanation for why they bend, right? But it turns out that comes for free in our model. The basic idea is in two dimensions, you have border cells that pin the, a, a two-dimensional attractor phase. And so then as the mouse leaves the border, it has to, um, the cell can only fire if the attractor phase moves a certain amount. And because of that, that effect, you get this bending of the grid cells. Uh, so that, that kind of shows up. If you extend, if you suddenly extend a border, the grid cells extend, and we have neural networks that do that as well. Um, I, I don't have the slides for that one. So yeah, the, does your model also predict the resolution of these points, like where no, that's these points a free, were? That's a free parameter in our model, because that has to do with the gain between how fast you're moving and how fast the bump moves. So if that gain is very fast, you move a little bit, the bump moves a lot, so you'll get multiple firing fields. So that's a free parameter. But you would need that pre-parameter because you see grid cells of all resolutions across the dorsal ventral axis. So if the, if the field was a rhombus, not a square? Yeah. Okay, or you know, parallel in there? Yeah. Do you, does the mouse perceive it, do the grid cells perceive it as different? If I looked at the grid cells, they'd be basically the same as I would be the grid cells. You know, I don't know of anyone who's done that experiment. People have done these trapezoidal things, presumably to get an effect. I'm not aware of a published work on the rhombus. Perhaps they didn't get an effect, which is why they didn't publish it. Um, okay, this is a good question. Um, I wish I knew. Okay, so now let's uh, talk, uh, like, yeah, let's give maybe five more minutes. I can give you a kind of a high level overview of the virtual reality experiments, which are kind of fun. Um, so again, the basic idea is, can we alter the laws of physics and change the gain between how much I move and how rapidly the world comes at me, right? And then um, observe what might happen in the system. So we actually, um, we, we made a prediction. Well, it was actually a, I'll tell you the story of it, but, but basically what we find is that if you change this gain a little bit, so path integration and landmarks don't disagree too much, the grid cells will phase shift. But if you change them, if you change the gain by a lot, so that landmarks and path integration disagree a lot, the grid cells will completely break free of landmarks and remap. So here's the basic experimental setup. I doubt them, I think it's a But um, let's see, what's the name? Oh, okay. But, but what you're looking at is here's a mouse running on a ball. These are, again, experiments done by Malcolm in Lisa's lab. I'm a completely incompetent experimentalist. I don't do any of the experiments. Um, but here's a mouse sitting on a ball. Uh, they're imaging or recording from the mouse, or cells in the entorhinal cortex of the mouse. The mouse can run on the ball, so they have a readout of the mouse's velocity. And in closed loop with that readout of the mouse's velocity, they make this virtual environment that has these prominent landmarks of tires move in proportion to how fast the mouse moves. Okay, so the mouse gets many, many trials through this environment, and it starts to think of this environment as a real environment. You get the normal grid cells in 1D, border cells, head direction cells, all of that stuff. That shows up. Oops. So, okay, so now here's the gain change experiment. So you could either do a gain increase or a gain decrease. So that, what that means is, so before, the baseline condition where the mouse has gotten used to it, think of that as gain one. The mouse moves one step, 
the, the, the environment moves one unit forward. A gain increase ex experiment could be, you know, the mouse moves one step, the environment moves 1.5 units forward, right? Or, or a gain decrease would be 0.5. So this gain parameter could be small, it could be close to one, or it could be large, far away from one. That's what I mean by small and large gain change. Okay, so Malcolm took all the data, they got all sorts of crazy results in the grid cells, and none of it made sense. So what we did was we temporarily ignored the data. And we asked, what would our model predict? Okay. And if you work it out, it actually predicts a very, um, it predicts something quite sensible that can be modeled using two coupled oscillators. So I think doubly people like coupled oscillators. <laughs> this is not really a phase lock loop, but it, it, it you know. But um, we don't do power anymore, so. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, fair no enough. One it. Yeah. Power is old school. <laughs> um, so, so how can we model this entire complicated system by two coupled oscillators? So if you think about what the model would do in this experiment, uh, so imagine the, the mouse is running, okay? So this is the attractor network. So the velocity of the mouse will move the bump round and round, okay? That's one oscillator. It's the phase advance due to path integration, and it's driven by the physical velocity of the mouse, how fast its legs are moving. But as it's moving through this 1D track, it's encountering a series of landmarks, right? Now each landmark will have a learned pinning phase, okay? So you can imagine there's a sequence of pinning phases pinning the attractor network as it moves forward. The advance of this oscillator is driven by vision alone. The advance of this oscillator is driven by locomotion on the ball alone, right? Um, they attract each other, so you have this Kuramoto-type coupling between them. The phase advance of the attractor network is driven by velocity with some gain, and the phase advance of the landmark is driven by velocity with a different gain, and that gain is none other than the gain that we impose on the system. So at gain one, these two gains are the same. At a different gain, what I've done is I now have two coupled oscillators at different frequencies that are attractively coupled, right? So at gain one, what happens is Velocity, locomotion moves this attractor around and round. The landmark pinning phases move round and round, and they're completely in sync with each other. But as I change the gain, I change the frequency of one oscillator, and we know a lot about coupled oscillators that are attractively coupled through a Kuramoto type coupling, but of different frequencies. If you make the frequency too large, so, well, A, if the frequency difference is small, they still entrain to each other. Let me move a slide from that. Yeah, if the frequency difference is small, or a subcritical one, they still entrain to each other, but with a fixed phase lag. But if the frequency difference is too large, they kind of have this complicated beating motion, right? Okay, if you transit this back to the grid cells, this predicts that for a small gain change, the grid cells will phase shift, and for a large gain change, they'll completely remap. And I won't show you all the data, but, but here's just two example cells. Here's a strong or large gain change, this is the cell's firing rate before the gain change. This is the cell's firing rate after the gain change, and there's a remapping event. Uh, this looks very different from that. That's what neuroscientists mean by remapping. Here's an example where you see a clear phase shift. Okay. And you can do a population summary and see that these are, that this is all in this paper. I won't. Now, let me tell you why neuroscientists don't publish much. Right? <laughs> so um, our reviewers made us do the following. They said, okay, you've predicted these two regimes, you observed them. We want you to do new experiments where you have an intermediate gain change. We want you to use your theory to predict which dynamical re regime you'd observe, and then we want you to verify your prediction. So this took the postdoc, Malcolm, six months of his life, unfortunately. I think it was a relatively unfair thing to do. But anyways, it all worked out. We did all of that and it worked out. Uh, and now P Malcolm is happy. He's a postdoc at Harvard now. He's, he's, he's gone on to a great, a great new job. Okay. All right, so I just wanted to end with some philosophy, right? We, we've talked about navigating physical space where we update position by integrating physical steps, but we correct positional errors by, by using landmarks, right? And this is how we've used to solve, this is what we've done to solve ancient problems about navigating space. But what's amazing about the human brain is that we've taken our experience derived from living within this limited region of space, our, the surface of our planet, 
that we've been able to reason about space in situations that are far removed from our perceptual experience. You know, we collectively as humans, mostly Einstein, right, invented black holes and gravitational waves as mathematical objects. And then just recently we've discovered them, right? So maybe, and these are ideas percolating in the neuroscience world, maybe our ability to navigate physical space eventually gave rise to an evolutionary precursor of our ability to navigate conceptual spaces. Where the analog of updating position by integrating physical steps is like updating deductions by integrating logical reasoning steps. And then we can also correct our deductive errors by actually doing experiments and taking into account experimental observations. So this kind of updating and correction thing, which you know, is the basis behind the common filter, uh, which is also the basis behind various slam algorithms, you know, might, might have on steroids led to our ability to reason. And I'll just, that's an <laughs> irresponsible speculation, but I'll leave you with that. All right, thanks. quite a lot uh, in the technique called redirected walking. So you want to make a small space appear like a larger space. Oh, okay. You map in the direction as you walk along. So even though you walk in a circle yeah. in VR, you think you walk in a line and you just can create this illusion of a really oh, large space. Okay. So you're dynamically remapping the landmark. I see. So it would be really interesting to think about, first of all, like, do these insights, could they generate any kind of new techniques in, yeah. in that? Kind of a world of VR, and then also, like, what's the difference between the mice and the humans? Actually, do you have any thoughts on that? Like, uh, <laughs> these mechanisms. We, we how how are they? So people have seen uh, grid cells in monkeys, but these are grid cells in games. So what happens in these same brain regions in monkeys? Right, we can navigate a space just by me standing here and looking around. So if you plot gaze on a two D kind of hemisphere, there are cells that fire if and only if. Uh, the gaze is on the vertices of a hexagonal grid on the 2D hemisphere. So they see that in monkeys. Uh, of course, people haven't seen that in humans because we can't, we can't look. But, um, yeah, that, that's one, one more question. Uh, so for human navigation, the vestibular system is super important. So you can get the linear acceleration and uh, angular yeah. velocity. Yeah, yeah. Right? So I, I kind of missed that part in the discussion as to what extent do your models and the data integrate, you know, Accelerometers. And yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, it's a great question. So, other people have worked on uh, earlier stage of the circuit where they look at how the vestibular system gives rise to low-level velocity representations and things like that. We, as, as usual in neuroscience, we solve certain problems and we assume other problems are solved for us by others. So, we assume the existence of velocity cells, which we observe in this brain circuit that our models don't say anything about how those velocity cells compute their velocity. Right. Actually, our Actually, I'll just say one thing. You just say one thing about it. So in these virtual reality experiments where we, where we change the game, we also looked at the velocity cells. Now there's two sources of computing velocity in this particular experiment. One is optic flow, and the other is locomotion. So what we found by changing the game, we could attribute how much of the cell's velocity computation came from optic flow versus locomotion. At high speeds, it's mostly optic flow. At low speeds, it's mostly locomotion. So it's as if it's doing some kind of Bayesian trade-off between these two information sources according to potentially how reliable they are, assuming that at high velocity there's stronger optic flow and that signal more reliable. So that's in the paper as well, but that's all we say about that. Okay. So good question. So speaking of this trade-off, uh, do you have an understanding of the relation between the resolution of one grid cell yeah. and another? Like, yeah, so said, wait, here's a fun fact, okay. the. Um, these grid scales, they come in modules, and you can compute the ratio of the larger scale to the smaller scale. It's not a continuum, they're discretized. And the ratio of the larger scale to the smaller scale is the either root two or E, depending on which theorist you talk to. And the experimental data kind of encompasses both. So there's this weird discretization. Is that somehow information theoretically optimal? That's an interesting question. Yeah, people have come up with different scenarios under which either root two or E are optimal where they think about things like Fisher information. Um, and we've trained neural networks to solve path integration, and we observe the emergence of, by the way, that weird circuit I showed you with the ring and all that ornate stuff, 
we just train a neural network to path integrate and we assume that firing rates are positive. And then we analyze the network and they automatically um, recover these grid cells using similar mechanisms to the one that the human brain came up with. So the one that the human brain came up with is not as ornate as you might expect. That same type of solution is found through backpropagation and solid path integration. That's a paper we're writing up right now. So there's likely to be, you didn't look at it, right. but there's likely to be some lower level thing that combines uh, peripheral uh, Definitely, yeah. perception and also, um, I guess, acceleration. That's right, yes. Yeah, in, into, then that drives the velocity. Yes, exactly. There's got to be an integrator of acceleration to get velocity yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Um, there's, I think the mammary bodies is one place where that's done. Of course, there could be others. 